sort of we guess that this is the main narrative to which um, the anti-immigration sentiments are sort of rooted in. Um, so yeah, we wanted to find some empirical evidence for if this is actually the case, uh, or if you know, if the natives actually compete on a completely different labor market um, to the immigrants who are coming in. So anyway, so the basic um, economic um, principles go. If there is an increase of supply of labor, then there, there are going to be lower wage levels in that region. Um, so in previous literature, there wasn't much, there wasn't a definitive answer in this matter. In the US, um, Borjas and Grossman found that there was actually no impact of the number of immigrants on the wage levels. And Altonji and Card sort of saw that there wasn't any displacement effect, which which basically means native population being pushed out because they couldn't get jobs or um, the wages have been lowered too much. On the other hand, Zimmerman and Deneu found that blue collar German workers wages reduced in um, 1960s Germany. And Roos and Braga Silva found that low wage workers are going to work out, are likely to lose out from immigration in the UK. So there's still an ongoing debate. And we want to sort of contribute to um, this whole thing through Sweden. So why do we choose Sweden? So Sweden accepted a lot of refugees. Uh, this is basically an exogenous shock to population and the labor market. And this should be independent of income unless we sort of assume that this culture of accepting immigration is somehow contributed to income growth. But we'll sort of ign ignore that for now. But I mean, the most important part was they have one of the richest data sources ever. And um, yeah, we wanted to exploit this and explore this. So we use Sweden, um, which has about 300 municipalities, um, and we use municipal level data, which means sort of we work out the average education level in that region and population density of that municip municipality and um, yeah, and so forth. Um, what else? Municipality. Um, so the yeah. data is taken from the National Swedish Statistics Bureau, SCB, for the Swedish data, and we will also use some data from the Danish National Statistics Bureau. So that's the sources of our data. Yeah. So what are our identification strategies? So we have three main ideas for our sort of analysis on income, which is, the first is the obvious one, panel data analysis, sort of on municipalities in Sweden. Uh, the second one is different and differences using Denmark as a counterfactual. Um, and the third is instrumental variables using an internal instrument, which means um, in a panel data, you can take sort of the lag of the time period using that as an instrument. We'll sort of explore that one by one. So this is the identification for the panel data analysis. We have log of average income on the left-hand side, and then we have alpha T, which is time fixed effect, um, beta I, which is state fixed effect, and then log immigration density. This gamma is our regressor of interest, coefficient of interest, sorry. And then uh, population density and years of education are our controls. So we think that the education level of that region and the population density of that region will obviously affect how rich that municipality is or well, the average income. As so, in, yeah, if, is it a city or not a city? Is it a uh, like low wage area or high wage area for ed education wise? Yeah, um, that's the basic idea. And in our sort of paper, we actually make a binary distinction between rural and cities as well. Um, but we basically see quite consistent results. We don't see any um, irregularities. So we have two-way fixed effects model. So it accounts for the time fixed effects. It's, that majorly accounts for the recovery from the 2008 financial crisis. And it accounts for municipality fixed effects, which is uh, the cause for potential heterogeneity, heterogeneity between municipalities. For instance, let's say your municipality is a mining town, then it's going to have a specific uh, feature unique to that municipality, so we want to account for that. 
So we see an average loss of about 4% per percentage increase in immigration. And note that this is a percentage increase in immigration, not percentage point. So let's say the immigration density goes from 25% to 27.5%. That would be a 10% increase, but only 2.5 percentage point increase. So yeah, we did this, so it's quite easy and intuitive to sort of interpret the answers. So this is the... Um, uh, regression table for uh, the sort of marginal income groups. So we didn't only just have uh, income, the average incomes of that region, we saw that uh, there was a uh, income group, a sort of nationality specific income data as well. So when we actually compared it to that, as opposed to the negative 4% we saw overall, we saw that the native Swedish actually didn't take any of this negative income hit they actually gained from it, 1.2%. And when you pull all the immigrants together, they lose 55% per, uh, per percentage increase in immigration. In and outside immigration. Yeah. And Scandinavian EU, we see um, sort of inconclusive results. And then agents and refugees, which are essentially people who just arrived in Sweden, people who only arrived for the last year or two. These people took the biggest hit. But so where was this income loss going to? The coefficient for Swedes are positives on average, whilst negative for all other immigration. Um, the most significant impact is for those that stayed in Sweden for the shortest amount of time. Um, oh, actually, I haven't got the first difference. But yeah, we weren't very happy with it because a lot of our fixed effects um, coefficients could be inconsistent because of time series issues and um, potential indigeneity issues concerning, you know, these people who just arrived in the country want to go to the regions that, um, that wish to earn a high income. So they tend to get concentrated in these sort of rich uh, cities. So that's the main problem we faced and we weren't very happy with these results. Um, so we tried the difference in differences strategy, which is that Denmark and Sweden have very similar economic environment, except they had a completely different um, di refugee policy. It's a political decision, not an economic one. And what we in the end saw was that by taking, um, by comparing Swedish and Danish municipalities and using 2014 as a time break when the, what was it? when the differences uh, in migration policy yeah. effectively changed due to the huge migration wave starting around 2014. Yeah, so we decided to use that as like a time break and the, yeah, and the treatment and control group. Um, treatment being Sweden and control being Denmark. So we saw that there was a negative 1.3% decrease. But really, we, we can't really say anything about that. As we saw before, we don't know where this income is going to. And we couldn't go further from this, largely due to the lack of data. We didn't know, um, we didn't have any data for Danish sort of locals and Danish immigrants and etc. So yeah, we, we see that there is this trend of negative coefficients, but we don't see, we, we can't conclude anything from it or deduce anything from it. So, what we have as our main sort of the most robust strategy is IV. What we do is as our first stage, we have in the initial immigration density, which leads to future immigration density. And that in turn leads to changes in average income. What we are saying is these immigrants are likely to go to where other immigrants have already settled. I mean, that's pretty common. And we saw from research in Germany, like a very recent one in 2018, that actually immigrants are likely to go to where their co-ethnic groups are. Uh, and there this, are some, uh, and this yeah. is in general because in Sweden, immigrants are allowed to, if they're able to, move to wherever they want to. So the allocation of new refugees into Sweden is quasi-random. Hence, since uh, people can choose, we use this choice when we investigate this question. 
there are a few cases where this would be violated and we mentioned it in our paper, but we think it is largely quite minor. Um, and this is uh, quite a robust method. And what we find is that overall income reduces by 1.1%, sort of similar to negative 1.3% we saw from the difference in differences model. And native Swedes gain about 4.4% for every increase in immigration. And Scandinavia, again, very um, ambiguous, but that's largely because Scandinavians are essentially, they have the same labor rights um, as Swedish people. They can just leave. So it's, um, they have sort of permanent residency and working rights. So it's, it's very obvious that they can just leave. In EU, we assume that the coefficient is positive because um, well, we, we think that a lot of skilled people will move to Sweden sort of for their sort of high tech manufacturing and things like that. So we think that's why this negative coefficient came about. And we see that it's negative 13% for people who just came to Sweden. So people who are the most sort of alien and the most unassimilated into the labor market are affected the most. Affected most. So what does this mean? Um, try, trying to interpret this in a uh, sort of most, the way that make, makes most sense is that there are actually sort of duality in this uh, labor market where, where um, native population and immigrant population uh, compete on sort of different sort of labor. Different labor. So, Native population can use la um, immigrant labor as sort of like a complement. So native population provide the managerial roles and um, immigrants provide the cheap labor. That's why uh, we're guessing that Swedes incomes have risen with immigration density increasing. There is also Whereas, a slightly different way of interpreting it. Sweden today has a very, very like high skill requirement for in its labor market. Uh, whereas uh, many of those who came to Sweden did not have the opportunity, for example, in Syria, to gain an as high education as is needed for the Swedish labor market. So uh, we don't have that many low skill jobs and we get a lot of low skill uh, labor immigration coming into Sweden. So this leads to them competing with previous immigrants who also are low skilled, leading to Swedes who tend to have higher like educational skill levels not being as effect affected by this whereas the low skill need or uh, face more competition. So what we have is that labor de uh, the labor demand of low skilled labor is just simply, uh, labor supply of low skilled labor is simply not absorbed by the demand. So we see this giant drop in income for every immigration that's the uh, rising. Um, so we decided to look a bit further and this is why I said dessert. Uh, we sort of looked at inequality, uh, which was looking at Gini coefficient and sort of income quartile analysis. Well, we found that the bottom 20% became poorer with more immigrants. It's not very surprising considering that most refugees are poor, um, but the problem is that this could be the case for the native Swedes who are like located in that income quartile. So are they being affected as well? Sort of how would they react? which is how we got along to the political shift part. And we saw that um, Sweden Democrats, which is the far right party in Sweden, um, their votes increased by 2.5 to 22.6 percentage points for every percentage increase in immigration in the year before and the two years before the election. So we, we're assuming, no, we're, I think we can guess that what's going on is native Swedes who are also, who is a minority, but can still have political power are being affected by um, this influx of refugees. But really for us to say this with confidence and with evidence, um, we need more micro level data, which is, which wasn't really possible um, at municipal level because the only, only thing we see is averages of the whole municipality rather than who's sort of affected in the region and etc. So these are the tables. Um, so concluding, concluding um, there's no real definitive conclusion that we can draw from this whole thing. We can't say that immigrants 
come and take our jobs or they don't take our jobs. But what we've seen is that there is a very big chance that the labor markets aren't as integrated as people seem to think. And they are largely separated to low skilled and high skilled. And we, we do need more micro level data on an individual level where we can look at, oh, does this someone have a low skill? Did, was this person directly affected by um, a rise in immigration density? So yeah, there's still room for improvement, but overall we see that the native population on average aren't affected by um, immigration density riding in that region. So that's what we found out. Thanks for listening. Great, great, thank you, that's wonderful. Um, does anyone have any question for Michael and Ming Suk? Please just, just unmute yourself and, and, and speak out your question, please. Any question? Okay, seems like everybody's very happy with, with your findings and they really enjoyed it. Um, moving on, we're, we'll, we will have Eddie, our, um, this year's head of research, to present their paper on development economics. Eddie, are you there? Yeah, hi everyone. Love that background. Um, if you'll excuse me later on if something comes up because it's actually 1.30 a.m. here and I'm not at my best, but I'm gonna try to present the stuff smoothly. Um, so can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for the opportunity for us to present the work. Um, this is joint work with mostly Bhargavi Das and Eleanor Jenker, but also Leonard and Nanushka. Uh, unfortunately, they can't make it today, so I'm going to present. Um, I'm Eddie. I was a research associate in the development team, and the, the title of our paper is to understand heterogeneous effects of FDI liberalization using the Make in India initiative in India. So to give you a roadmap of what the presentation is going to be about, we'll give a bit of motivation for our question, some context, and we'll talk a bit about the data we used before moving on to the empirical strategy or exactly what identification strategy we used. Finally, we're gonna talk about results and some policy implications. So about motivation and why we chose the research question. First of all, what the paper does is it builds on a previous paper in 2019 to quantify the effects of um, FDI liberalization policy in reducing capital misallocation while considering the heterogeneous or differential effects of the policy on different industries depending on their pre-existing characteristics. And the reason why this question is worth researching, why we move, why we chose the research question is partly motivated by the existing literature which found that there are substantial aggregate consequences from microeconomic distortions, especially in the misallocation of facts of production. So intuitively, when productive firms are not allocated the factors they need, and when inefficient firms are able to persist in the market, productivity growth suffers. However, most of the existing literature, um, they worked more on pinning down the exact aggregate or the rough aggregate consequences of misallocation of factors of production. Less is known about what policies work and what don't to reduce the misallocation of factors of production. So if we want to know about how we can reduce these frictions that generate productivity stagnation, we need better empirical evidence on what policies affect the misallocation and the directions of those changes in misallocation as a result. In order to better establish causality on that front, we exploit a recent liberalization episode in India where the government basically liberalized many sectors for foreign direct investment to provide more conclusive evidence regarding the effects of opening up to foreign capital on misallocation of capital and also think about how it affects different industries differently. So about why we chose India or why we chose the FDI liberalization policy. Well, it's partly because of the scale of FDI in India and the potential economic influence it has. So as you can see, there has been this exponential growth in FDI inflows into India, um, starting from 2000 all the way until the end of 2018, 
and official statistics also suggest that FDI inflows over the past five years accounted for nearly 50% of total inflows in the last two decades. Even though we don't take a stance about whether liberalization uh, helped increase FDI inflows, we just want to remind you that the magnitude of these inflows mean that there, there is reason to concern how FDI can have tremendous impacts in the Indian economy. Since we're using the policy as a major source of variation, um, since we're using the FDI policy as a major source of variation, it's important that we think about how we got the data on the policy. So we collected the data at the most specific industry level using this liberalization episode that started in September 2014. By liberalization, it really means that there has been an increase in the maximum percentage of equity that foreign investors can hold in an Indian firm, or a change in investment route for, from what we call government route to the automatic route. So basically meaning that you don't need prior approval as a foreign investor to engage in foreign direct investment in that sector anymore. We construct this main policy variable, which is an indicator variable, using the policy circulars from the Indian government. And this shows a distribution of the number of what we call liberalization episodes in the study period. So we define one liberalization episode as when there has been an increase in the maximum percent of equity or when there has been a change in investment. So that shows a list of the sectors that we focus on, the sectors that were liberalized. And since we're conducting the study at the industry and at the firm level, it's important that we have a detailed source of information about the firms in India. To do that, we leverage data from the annual survey of industries, which is India's, one of, uh, India's two largest panel data sets. We uh, construct this 2006 to 2018 panel of registered manufacturing firms, and around 30,000 firms were surveyed every year. So it records detailed plant information for each of those firms, which we're going to use for our analysis. So next up, we'll move on to the identification strategy we use in order to identify our parameters of interest. So clearly, our parameters of interest would be something that relates to the effective FDI liberalization on uh, misallocation, and in this case, particular uh, misallocation of capital. So the strategy we adopt is a modified difference in differences framework by exploiting the differential timing of FDI liberalization in different five-digit industries. Intuitively, you can think of it as comparing the pre-post differences between industries that liberalized before 2006 and those that liberalized 2000, after 2014. So by conducting this um, twice or like a double different strategy, it allows us to address biases due to stationary characteristics of industries or firms and also the yearly shocks that are common to all the industries because they're differenced out during the process. So in using the method, we rely on the identification assumption of parallel trends. What it means is because we're using um, the industries that were liberalized before as a control group, it means that we're assuming time trends and outcome variables for these control groups are good counterfactuals or approximations to the time trends for treated energies had them not been treated. So fundamentally, this is not an assumption that can be directly testable, but we offer some uh, suggestive evidence in the paper in the presentation about whether this assumption is reasonable. So um, the outcome variables we focus, are, uh, we focus on are really the common outcome variables at the firm and the energy level. We focus on relatively a richer set of variables because of data availability. We've deflated all of these outcome variables using either the wholesale price index or the consumer price index. And if you're worried about regional price or regional inflationary pressure, in all of our regressions, we control for state year fixed effects. So that remove um, state region time specific uh, price shocks over different years. And the presentation focuses on the firm level specifications. If you're interested in the industry level regressions, you can check the paper. So that brings us to motivate exactly what our establishment or the firm level empirical strategy is going to be. Since we consider misallocation, we have to think of misallocation under a more structured framework. So in a paper consistent with Paz literature, we view misallocation as an implicit tax on the price of an input X to a firm. So because of the implicit tax or because of misallocation, the firm faces the input price of one plus tau times PI. 
And one example of that misallocation is, um, which was studied by a previous paper, is the existence of credit constraints in efficient credit allocation. So you can imagine when the most efficient firms, they can't borrow as much as they want to purchase inputs, whereas the less efficient firms, because of their connections with state-owned banks, can get cheaper sources of credit. That's a pretty common example of how some firms might not get um, the, the input that they need for production and how they face this implicit tax. For example, they face a higher source of higher cost of sourcing capital. So after that, we need to derive this measure of misallocation in the actual data because there isn't any actual uh, measure of misallocation outright there in the data and we need to um, derive some estimation or derive some proxy. So what we chose to use is the pre-liberalization measure of marginal revenue product of capital of a firm as a proxy for the degree of capital misallocation. And the reason was basically that under profit maximization, firms equate their prices of the input to the marginal revenue product of that input. And in the case of capital, which we focus on, they would equate the input price of capital with MRPK. So we reasoned that firms whose MRPK were above industry median pay this higher implicit tax or they face higher tout. So that higher tout distorted their use of capital more from the efficient level. And so we come up with this um, testable implication uh, driven by or led by the existing literature from the paper by Bauer Maitre, which is that if FDI liberalization led to relative growth in the use of capital and the relative decline for MRPK after uh, it happened for these firms which had higher previous MRPK, then it provides evidence for the reduction in tau faced by these firms, thus reducing misallocation of capital. So even though we know that MRPK can be used to approximate tau, we still don't have it in the data. We still need to construct an empirical proxy for it. So in that, we chose to use the ratio of sales and capital. We used uh, the five-year moving average of that ratio to proxy for a firm's MRPK, partly because under this revenue production function, you could, under the assumption of constant capital share across an industry, you derive this proportional relationship between an industry's or a firm's MRPK and the ratio of sales to capital. So that solves two big problems. One, how do you proxy for misallocation of capital? Two, how do you find a measure of that misallocation of capital in the actual data? That leads us to the firm level regression that we're gonna run. So we run a panel data fixed effects model for the establishment observed I, uh, I in five digit industry J at state S in year, in year T. So that tells us what the subscript, subscript means. So Y really means the lot outcome variables and we uh, not only use the key treatment variable FDI, but also interact it with an indicator variable for if a plant or if a firm's pre-liberalization average MRPK exceeded its four-digit industry median. So if it exceeded it for in four-digit industry median, we reason that it faced stronger misallocation ex ante. So COPPA2 is our parameter of interest, and we interpret it as the differential effect of being exposed to liberalization to high MRPK plants compared to low MRPK plants. So as you can see, COPPA2 really is doing this within industry between firm comparison because it's comparing for firms between firms in the same industry but with different characteristics. We include three sets of fixed effects. Um, the first one is obviously establishment or firm fixed effects to absorb the stationary characteristics of firms. The second is to account for yearly shocks that are common to all the firms within different industries. And the third one was motivated by some contemporaneous policies in India during the period, because India connect, conducted some state level reforms in their ease of doing business regulations. And we were concerned that these state specific reforms could have biased our estimations had we not control for them. So we control for state year fixed effects. We also cluster standard errors at the establishment or the firm level in order to account for serial correlation of the same establishment over years. So um, that gives you a sense of the results we have from these panel data fixed effects regressions we ran. A few things are very um, important or a few things we do take note of. The first one is that there is an 8.5 relative growth, percent relative growth in capital investments for high MRPK firms compared to their low MRPK counterparts. And the second one, second thing to take note of is that high MRPK firms experience relative losses in labor productivity, output and sales in, in, in response to liberalization. 
The third one is basically to reason that because of the presence of strong and significant growth in capital investments of high MRPK firms, and because of the strong and significant reduction in MRPK in marginal revenue product of capital for these firms which had high MRPK, it provides some suggestive evidence that within firm, there has been a reduction in the dispersion of MRPK. And, there, and therefore, an FDI liberalization had helped reduce capital misallocation to an extent. And all our results are unchanged if we don't use state your fixed effects in the regressions. So that was the main results and the only set of results that we're going to focus on in the presentation. Um, next up, we'll basically talk a bit about the dynamic effects. So what it, uh, what it does is basically it does two things. One, it checks whether our assumption of parallel trends makes some sense. The other, it thinks about how the effects of liberalization varied over time. So the firm level regressions really focus on within industry between firm comparison. In order to have an unbiased estimate of COPPA 2, the differential effect, we assume that the outcome variable trends um, for low and high MRPK firms in the same treated industries are our own parallel trends. So the trend in the outcome for, of low MRPK firms is a valid counterfactual for the trend for a high MRPK firm. In order to kind of indirectly test for this assumption, we conduct this placebo test where we run the outcome against all of the leads and lacks of the treatment variables that we're interested in. So in this case, when n is smaller than zero, it, mean, it basically asks whether there has been a changing outcome for, uh, for, for the pause before the policy took place. Um, when, when we presumably assigned a policy to took place in six years before. So basically, you're thinking about whether the, the future policy had affected pause outcomes. And the absence of differential effects before liberalization bolstered the confidence in a parallel trends assumption. So the results is for three of our outcomes, we failed, we failed to reject the joint hypothesis of zero trend. And we failed to reject these hypotheses at a 10% significance level. For these outcome variables, we plot the results. We plot the year-by-year -year interaction coefficients to get you a sense of how yearly effects of liberalization change over time. So um, from these three graphs, what we really want you to focus on, what we really want you to take away, is that there has been a progressive effect in uh, progressive growth in the relative use of capital for high MRPK firms after it's experienced liberalization, and that before liberalization, you see no significant trends in the use of capital. Um, that's, there has been an equal or similar pattern for sales and output. So generally, the use of sales for high MRPK firms was on a moderate upper trend before it suddenly Heard went on the downward trend. We wrap everything up in two minutes or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, the, the one thing that we really focus on, which is the changing marginal revenue product of capital following liberalization, confirmed the hypothesis, or um, it, it's, it, it's consistent with the hypothesis that misallocation had been reduced after, misallocate, uh, after FDI liberalization because of the progressive reduction in MRPK. So um, some summary of the findings at the firm level. So we see that exposure to liberalization led to this 8.5% relative growth in capital and a 16.3% relative uh, reduction in NRPK. And, however, and that they did not seem to benefit from liberalization in a sense of short to medium run losses in terms of labor productivity, sales and output losses. And a few policy implications is that at the industry level, the results which we don't present here, liberalization disproportionately benefit industries with higher export intensity. And at the firm level, liberalization could reduce misallocation of capital by allowing firms which face larger exonta distortions to invest more. However, they led to short to medium run losses. And so we don't expect it to be a silver, to be a magic bullet if governments want to improve domestic business performance. Precisely what are the mechanisms behind these adjustments process require further research. And that's all for the presentation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eddie, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Does anyone have any question for um, this paper, uh, for Eddie? Unmute yourself or put, that or put that question in the chat. If not, if not, we're going to... Oh, we have a we have a question, Eddie. We have a question from um, Christopher. Um, who, um, Christopher wonders: 
if you could talk briefly about the policy implications. Um, yeah, sure. So um, I think it was in the, in the last slide, which I, which I went on very quickly. Um, so basically what we found was that firms which were more exonate, more constrained by the use of capital, which was proxied by their higher MRPK, they faced this relative growth in their capital and a large relative reduction in their MRPK. So that provides some evidence that there has been a decrease in the dispersion of MRPK after liberalization, or that some of uh, these firms which have been more constrained could benefit from liberalization. But we see no obvious evidence that these firms benefited from liberalization because they experienced this relative loss in output and sales. So that caution is against uh, saying that liberalization benefit these firms, even though it could reduce misallocation of capital. Hope that answers the question. Do you have any further question? Um, okay, can I just I, add a question? Sure. Sorry, did someone say something? Michael? No? Uh, sure. Uh, I was just like, you said that, we're, that the marginal revenue product is decreasing, but isn't it generally the case that like marginal products of labor or something decreases when like capital increases in general, or like how did you treat that? Uh, I'm sorry if I uh, missed it in the presentation. Oh yeah, so um, yes, it's it's so what we thought of was you know at the profit maximization condition you equate input price to MRPK, and if you consider that the input price in the input price there is a tau because of the tax, then higher MRPK would suggest that the tau was higher compared to other firms assuming that these firms in the same industry had faced the same input price for the same capital price. So if you see them using capital more compared to other firms, and if you know that they had higher tau before, that suggested that these, cap these firms, which were more in a sense thirsty for capital, had been given what, what they want or what they need in terms of okay. increased capital. Thank you so much. No worries. Thanks, Michael, for your question. Uh, I believe someone else. We have um, we have another another question from someone else. If you could, oh uh, yes, we have a new question. So Eddie, um, someone asks if there's a specific reason why you chose this as your research topic. So why did you choose this as your research topic? Um, I think it was. So we, we didn't arrive at the question in the first place. We arrived at a similar question. It was when we were, well, the, the research theme of our working group was, the, was initially the impact of arrival of foreign firms on domestic firms in general. So we um, were researching on possible policies that affected how easy it is for foreign firms to enter. And we came across this, uh, this this episode in in India because it was very popular in the media about how it could be transformative in Indian manufacturing, and and so we were very interested in that and how we could leverage that in particular. That's I think how we arrived at it. Okay, um, we we do need to move on to our next the next topic on um, liberal economics. Um, Ola, are you there? Are you there? Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Ola and I led the uh, group for uh, the labor economics uh, stream. So I'll share my slides in a second. Are you able to see the screen? Okay. Cool. So, um, and not all of us are here, but um, it was basically me and uh, Celine, who's here, uh, Caroline and Isabel. And we looked at the um, question of what is the impact of vocational education on various labor market outcomes in Germany and um, well, what are the policy implications of our results? So just to give you an outline, a roadmap of where we're going, we'll uh, give you the motivating questions to begin with, 
Celine will uh, give you a little bit of background, the context um, of the German education system and the labor market. We'll tell you a little bit more about the empirical challenges that economists typically face in uh, trying to answer these questions, um, as well as our identification strategy and um, uh, what we really uh, add in terms of uh, the literature that's existing. Um, the data sources we use, our estimation strategy, and finally, we'll present the results and give you the conclusions and policy implications. So um, we're, we, we're interested in the economic benefits of education in general, and we were particularly curious about um, what are the economic benefits of investing in vocational education? and who, benefit, who benefits the most and under which circumstances? Like a lot of governments have typically um, uh, developed vocational education as a pathway for maybe those who are uh, uh, less academically inclined and have kind of promoted it as um, an alternative pathway. So is it really worth the large investments that governments have made? So more specifically, our research question um, is, what is the impact of vocational education on labor market outcomes in Germany? And we look at a variety of labor market outcomes, but the ones um, we're most interested in are earnings, the probability of unemployment, the probability of being fired, and the length of unemployment. Um, so I'll hand it over to Celine here, who will give you a bit more um, context. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Ola. So now I'm just going to quickly walk through the context surrounding vocational education and the German education system. So firstly, why do we focus on vocational education? So vocational education and training, also known as VET, is frequently perceived as improving the opportunities of youths who lack resources, skills, or motivation to continue on with any higher education. So many economists have argued that VET provides useful skills to prepare young individuals for labor market and therefore improve their chances of having a successful career later on. Others have argued that VET allows students to develop more flexible skills, which really prepares them in a job market that can see a lot of change due to automation. So modern governments have, been, have become increasingly challenged to develop educational solutions, and many of them are starting to see VET as a way in which they can do this. Next slide, please. All right, so in this diagram here, you see the very many paths associated with the German education system. So Germany is a very interesting case study because it has a very institutionalized system for training students. And it is also fairly rigid. Now, given that Germany has a very strong state system, its education system varies a lot across different states. But on the whole, there's some general baseline aspects. German elementary school, Grundschule, lasts from four to six years after which most states separate students into different streams. One is gymnasium, which results in the abitur, which is a level that gives students a general maturity certificate, after which they can go on to enter university. Then they have Realschule, which is, gives you an intermediate maturity certificate. And then there's Hauptschule, which is a general secondary school, which gives you a vocational education certificate. So the segmentation is dependent on academic performance and in times also based on parental preference, though this, this depends on the state. The most important thing is the streaming happens very early in a student's educational career. So on the slide after, the German labor market has been of interest to many economists, in part because of its large reforms towards competitiveness in the last two decades. So as a result, we have seen decreasing unemployment rates, increasing participation rates, and gradually increasing labor compensation. Some challenges it faces includes young workers being at a greater risk of unemployment or underemployment, the risk of automation, and aging population. Okay, so um, given this context, um, a lot of um, economists have tried to look at this, um, but there are just some fundamental issues that um, prevent us from getting to uh, causal impact we're interested in. Um, and the first one is that there's a classic selection issue in that, I mean, 
perhaps better students select out of vocational education and into general ed education. And of course, we're unable to observe ability. So um, this kind of limits um, our ability to make progress on that issue. Um, the other thing is um, some, some uh, papers have uh, tried to use instrumental variables. Um, and they typically use father's education as an instrument, but um, this is relatively outdated and there are some reasons to think that it could violate instrumental, uh, the instrument's exogeneity. So our identification strategy is two-pronged. The first idea is that we created a synthetic control group. And what we mean by this is that from our data, we're able to um, identify people who have obtained a vocational maturity certificate and they're assigned to our treatment group. And we also observe people who've obtained a general maturity certificate. And these are people who have the opportunity to continue on for further education, uh, but but they don't, at least the, these are the, this is the group that we're picking as a comparable control group. And basically it's, uh, it's, it's high school dropouts um, with a general maturity certificate. So, I mean, we hypothesize that maybe perhaps um, this group is more comparable um, in terms of unobservables. Um, now, uh, I guess the, the second novelty of um, our paper is that we are using a new policy relevant instrument. Um, and how do we do that? We exploit temporal and spatial exogenous variation in the federally allocated budget for vocational education across Germany in each of its 16 states. So we use the ratio of vocational, edu the vocational education budget to each state's overall education budget. Um, and we say this is policy relevant because through instrumentation, we're actually identifying the effect for the group of compliers. So the people who are actually induced into taking up vocational education as a result of increased funding in their state. Um, and this is very desirable from a policymaker perspective. Um, for our data sources, we use the German Socioeconomic Panel. Um, it's very large and comprehensive, so that's helpful. Uh, we also merge it with the Federal Statistical Office of Germany data. And that's where we get our uh, budget data. So uh, th this is an overview of our estimation strategy. We estimate four key regressions. Uh, where uh, we're primarily interested in four outcome variables, the log wage. Um, actually, there's the next slide kind of gives you an overview of um, our outcomes. We have the logged wage of individual I. Uh, we also have unemployed, which is a binary edge indicator for whether um, the individual has ever been unemployed, fired, um, a binary as well for uh, whether they've ever been fired, and length of unemployment is the number of years that the individual has been unemployed. Um, for our explanatory variables, um, we have uh, vocational, which is a binary indicator for whether the individual has obtained a vocational maturity certificate. We control for years of experience, years of experience squared. Uh, we, could, we have a binary indicator for sex and another one for whether they're German born and finally, for the state that they're in. So before we proceed um, with looking at the regressions, um, we, we did a balancing test between the treatment and control. And it's relatively balanced between both groups. The exception is years of experience. We find that um, people in the treatment group have slightly more work experience on average, but we think this is reasonable given that the vocational stream ultimately entails uh, work experience as part of their educational training. Um, we also see some slight difference, a slight difference uh, for one of the states, but we don't think um, this is a very big issue. Um, all right, so we run some OLS regressions and um, although we don't really trust these regressions, they just serve 
as a baseline um, to compare IV regressions with later on. So um, our OLS regressions show that there's almost a 50% increase in wages, a 13% decrease in probability of unemployment, and uh, uh, almost 4% increase in the probability of being terminated, and a 0.08 month increase in the length of unemployment experience on average. Um, if we look at our first stage regressions for the IV, uh, we can see that we have uh, statistically significant results. So uh, we have a strong first stage, you could say. Um, and our uh, F statistic is uh, reasonably large, suggesting that we probably are not suffering from a weak instrument problem. Um, so yeah, uh, this is the output of our IV regressions. And we find, interestingly, uh, contrary to the OLS results, uh, that receiving vocational training um, in place of general education training had statistically no uh, significant effect on wages and the probability of being terminated by the employer, but resulted in almost an 80% increase in the probability of unemployment and a 0.9 month increase in the length of unemployment on average. Uh, we also look at some heterogeneous uh, impact treatment effects. So uh, we find that if we uh, stratify by gender, um, it actually doubles the probability of unemployment for women relative to men. I mean, this is expected. The uh, gender differentials in the labor market is well documented, and I guess Germany is not an exception to that. Uh, we also look at the German-born status of individuals. And we find that there are stronger and more positive results on the risk of unemployment and length of unemployment for German-born individuals. So this might suggest that perhaps um, German-born individuals are better able to navigate the vocational education system, or um, maybe they uh, it's somehow uh, better tailored uh, for them uh, compared to people who are non-German-born. Finally, um, perhaps most interesting, um, we uh, also stratify by time period where we look at um, the pre-post financial 2008 crisis and we find that the probability of unemployment and length of unemployment is just uh, magnified in the period between 2009-2017, suggesting that um, job security um, in, in, in an um, economically deteriorating environment um, is uh, not really achieved for people with a vocational education certificate. Um, so I guess it, it's, uh, these are interesting results um, to the extent that um, vocational education is often uh, promoted as a com as a pathway to gain skills and embark on successful careers um, and often giving students the opportunity to do apprenticeships. Um, so our results show that even after addressing to an extent, to a considerable extent, uh, selection and endogeneity issues, that individuals uh, with vocational education credentials are at are at an um, employment disadvantage, particularly from the perspective of job security. Um, and we, we had a few thoughts about maybe why this is happening and um, maybe you guys have some ideas too. Um, one idea is that maybe individuals with general education are actually competing with um, people who, are, uh, who have vocational education for similar jobs and maybe they're perceived as a higher value in the, in the job market. It could also be that firms would rather, would rather let go of vocational workers than retrain them uh, on the job. Um, so in light of all these results, um, some questions that we have is, well, 
should governments focus their efforts on developing the vocational education system further or maybe they should invest in other interventions some might say that there's already some path dependency that has taken place and that uh, we should be trying to look at earlier interventions and like by the time people reach vocational education it's kind of hard to um, fundamentally alter uh, their labor market outcomes and there is growing evidence that points to um, early childhood interventions um, as early as birth or even in utero um, being uh, particularly effective in um, improving uh, people's life outcomes. So yeah, um, that basically ends the presentation. And uh, we'll end with some acknowledgments to Professor Steve Pishka for providing us with access to the data set, uh, Dr. Khan for his help with the econometrics, and Carrie from the uh, Economic Society for his support uh, throughout the project. And thank you for your time. Brilliant, thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for the team? Any questions? Feel free to either turn on your mic or put it in the chat. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Yeah. So my question was, I'm sure you've heard like Gavin Williamson in the UK saying that we should try to have a German style education system. So I was wondering how much do you think this can be applicable in improving our vocational training in the UK, considering the differences in the structure of the German and UK labor markets? I think there, there's some research by uh, Professor Sandra McNally, who looks at the UK system. Um, and I haven't looked at it um, personally, but um, I think it's probably more positive than the <laughs> results we're presenting. So I, I'd also be curious to, to learn more about why, why those differences emerge. Brilliant. Thank you. Any other questions? If there isn't any other questions, in the interest of time, we will move on to the final one. Apologies to everyone, because you do realize we're as usual, kind of running um, over time. If anyone needs to leave, obviously feel free. But in preparation for our last group, we have Macro. So, um, thank you very much. And I'll try to be quick. So, uh, here we are. So, um, well, yes. Um, Francesco, one small thing, yes. your voice is a little bit um, mild. Do you mind speaking you, a bit louder? It's fine, you just need to speak yes. a bit louder. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me right now? How's it going right now? Fine. This is a bit better, yeah. Okay, fine, thanks. So we are the macro group and this is our paper. We are researching how monetary and macroeconomic policy was implemented during the Bretton Woods era, which is a particular period which has many interesting policy implications. And we are going to examine it and we are going to learn and to understand empirically how monetary and macroeconomics, so fiscal and currency policy, was actually implemented in that time. So this is indeed the scope of our paper. So we are going to analyze how it was implemented. And this mainly refers to two aspects. The first is that the instruments targets assignments for macroeconomic policy. So you know from Tim Bergen that it was stated in the 50s in the first post-war era, that it was that the foundations were laid down for the theory of economic policy and Tim Bergen, who was the first Nobel Prize recipient, had stated the theorem that you need an equal number of instruments for a certain number of targets. In this case, we are referring to three instruments, which are basically monetary policy, fiscal policy and currency policy for three targets, which are the internal balance. So basically full employment as it was interpreted in, in the 40s and in the 50s, or simply the right level of GDP and employment 
coupled with the external balance, so the uh, and even a balanced trade balance, and sure. finally price stability. And we are using France for two reasons. The first is that France was very known, was famous for a particular implementation of monetary policy, which we're going to investigate in our study. And this phenomenon is very highly documented. And this basically means that we have lots of reports, of historical reports, of evidence, and some preceding literature on which we can build our model and our study. The second reason, which is basically tightly related to this one, is that we already do have a database and we can directly use the, these data, which are of, they can be found more easily rather than collecting them for other countries, for example, the UK, which are a bit more difficult to come by. So the theoretical model the, at, the, at that time, the consensus for macroeconomic policy was, of course, the ISLM model, because in the 30s and the 40s, there had been the shift in the view through the work of Keynes and the neoclassical synthesis. So there was the consensus among economists and among politicians and among central bankers at least in the Western world, in the most advanced economies, that on the short run, due to price rigidities, it was possible for fiscal and monetary policy to achieve some certain employment and output targets. And this was the very core of how basically macroeconomic policy was thought. So this is the ISLM model or ADAS, very simple model. And of course, this can also be extended to the open economy framework by making use of the Mandel Fleming model. So this is the theoretical context in which we are moving since it was mainly the consensus of that time among policymakers. And so at this point, as I had just stated before, I keep repeating, we have three policy targets and three policy instruments. Now we move to the historical context, which rather was the Bretton Woods era. This is now the two contexts, so the um, theoretical and the historical context are tightly related among themselves, since basically the international arrangement, the international monetary system was built in a certain way as to favor basically growth enhancing growth oriented policies and in the Bretton Woods era exchange rates between countries were actually fixed so this meant that actually the exchange rate was not floating you could not freely buy foreign currency unless you had special permissions so it was a very segmented and fractioned market and this was complemented with international capital controls, which basically meant that many investors, many financial corporations could not buy foreign securities unless they had a specific permission. This is a very important element and has a very important implication for monetary policy because this allowed for a spread between the domestic and the foreign interest rate um, structure. And these therefore allowed to keep interest rates artificially low and in particular lower than they would have rather been according to the interest rate parity since there are international capital controls and fixed exchange rates, the, the interest rates parity does not hold. And since the exchange rates were fixed, the external balance that is a balanced foreign deficit was rather achieved not by devaluing the currency, which until 1971 was not possible except in exceptional circumstances, but rather it was done by international capital controls and by cooling down domestic demand.
And finally, restrict the countercyclical policy. There was this view that it was mostly monetary policy. So contrary to the common wisdom that we have today, where today the main view of the New Keynesian model is that monetary policy can be expansionary except in a liquidity trap and except for expectations and all that. The general view was at least some 10 years ago, at least, that monetary policy was the main tool for expansions while you know, up to the 70s, so in the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s, or up to the 60s, it was thought that monetary policy was at mostly counter-cyclical, so interest rates were just seen as a hike in order to cool down the economy, while fiscal policy was seen as mostly expansionary. And in particular, there is a very important part, which is what the consensus was on monetary policy implementation at that time, because as monetary policy was by consensus mostly restrictive, it was implemented not by maneuvering the discount rate, but rather by implementing direct controls on the money market, on the flow of credit to the economy, and on direct banks' balance sheets and all technical ratios and other. These are technicalities with which I do not want to bother you because they are. For who's interested, they are reported thoroughly in the paper. I'm just going to summarize what the fundamental implication under the macroeconomic standpoint, well, the macroeconomic standpoint, and for who's interested in macroprudential stuff can check the paper. The point was that so the monetary authorities were able to affect directly the flow of credit to the real economy without passing through the interest rate channel. And this was very important because this allowed mainly a disconnect between the interest rates and the monetary policy stance. So you could have a contraction in monetary policy while still having low interest rates, which seems actually a contradiction. But as you remember, keeping the interest rates low in the post-war post -war war era was very important because uh, it was needed to ensure the sustainability of government debt because most European economies exited the Second World War with a very high public debt, which was not sustainable unless the real interest rates were negative. So this meant a positive, although not very large, inflation and the nominal interest rate should have been very, very low. And this meant that you could have both achieve your price stability targets without at the same time impairing the sustainability of public debt. And in particular, there is the, the main reference from which we work is the paper by Monet. He says that the consensus view among policymakers and central bankers was that the discount rates had basically lost their meaning. They were not so fundamental as they had been once to determine the monetary policy stance. And this is the, the, the core of our paper, of our contribution. We want to assess quantitatively the effects of the credit controls on of the, all of the macroeconomic variables, starting from, of course, an aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. So, as I was just quoting, there are two main references. The first is Aikman, Bush and Taylor, and they comment on the British experience. They implement a augmented local projections model, which is kind of similar to what we are doing, but they build an aggregate index of monetary policy stringency. So they take out all the different kind of regulatory direct control measures, which were a lot, varying over time and basically they were changed by the regulators because banks tried to overcome them tried to do in a way so that they were not affected and in order to do these finally this basically happened that there, there were too many instruments they tried to build an index of all of these 
of, all, of trying to capture the overall monetary stance by taking some kind of average of all these different measures. However, this is a problem because it's not very difficult to understand how some measures, for example, credit ceilings, so a ceiling on a, per, on, on a number expressed in value terms, lows, uh, is, uh, emits. It's not very easy to understand if how much it, it's possible to see if they are really uh, stringent or not. So this is a problem and we tried to overcome on this and rather we tried to um, basically see the approach by Monet. We use the approach by Monet, which is a narrative approach. Narrative approach basically identifies monetary shocks using a dummy variable, which takes up value one when there is a contractionary shock and zero otherwise. This is qualitative, it's narrative, so we don't have a precise coefficient to interpret, but we are able still to understand how the effect is on the real economy. On the other hand, we prefer to use a local projections model instead of VAR as it has been used by Monet. Why? Well, this is a much more flexible approach and we are able to insert a lot of more dependent variables rather than two or four. So we are able to retrieve a general equilibrium framework and to account for all of the um, feedback of the endogenous variables on the policy instruments and therefore to have a truly general equilibrium ADAS model. So in the local projections method, we calculate the impulse responses basically by finding the effects of a shock, which is epsilon and beta H is of course the uh, effect of the shock. So the impulse responses for H periods ahead of the endogenous variable. So it's, happen, it's, it's basically like if we had a standard VAR, but it's much more flexible and we don't have all the problems with the identification. And our horizon, so capital H, is about, is, it's not about, it's definitely three years. So in its 36 months or rather uh, it's um, 12 quarters. And we also try to account for um, basically state dependence. So to see if contractionary shocks were more effective in expansions or in recession, this is a very um, important topic which has been investigated a lot recently, uh, basically because there is empirical evidence that the economy is more volatile in expansions than in recessions. And so there is rational for thinking that uh, shocks may be much mighty in much mightier in expansion rather than in recession. And so this is the same model as before, but now in this point, we are having a, the state variable Fz, which defines a smooth transition between two states as it's, bound, as it's uh, bounded between zero and one, and it's roughly is interpreted as the probability of a recession and it's defined as Z, which is the normalized, um, so it's the, is the growth, is the quarterly smooth growth rate and it's normalized by value. And at the same time, it's also um, uh, de defined as the, um, other, the um, theta is a parameter. So let's dive straight into the controls as we don't have so much time. Um, I'll just say that we are insert, so we are analyzing the effect of the credit control on the price level and the industrial production. And we see that there is um, a standard normal effect. It's a standard contractionary effect on prices and industrial production. So um, I'm just rushing because we haven't got so much time. <laughs> And Sorry, do you mind taking like maybe time. one to two more minutes? I think okay, I have around one to two more minutes left. Okay, fine. So um, this is the effect. So it's positively significant. 
we have a strong effect both on the price level and industrial production. So we see that direct controls, the narrative shocks have a, a significant effect as countercyclical policy. And the same applies for the credit to the private and the public sector. Further, there's also a decrease in the money stock, which is M2 in this particular framework. And basically, they also cause some kinds of, um, basically, uh, some effects on the short-run liquidity of the um, money market, as, of course, they cause the money market to dry up. And finally, we are going to uh, examine the effect on the exchange rate. So on the one hand, we are showing that the exchange rate has um, basically tends to revalue, so it's because it's quoted uh, in volume quotation, while the uh, trade balance improves. This is, of course, normal because the um, contractual shocks cools down domestic demand and therefore it decreases imports. So we can see that it was, it also played a major role in stabilizing the foreign deficit, which was a major problem in the immediate post war era for many countries, including France. Now we try also the asymmetrics IRF, however, they are some kind of inconclusive because there is a problem of endogeneity and the, yes, for the expansion and therefore the dependent variable has a lot of variance and this means that we cannot very draw so much conclusions. The same applies for the industrial production and the uh, tests, which are not, are, are not very powerful because of the too much, too too high a variance of the um, of the variable in recession. On the other hand, we are also showing the effects of discount rate shocks, which strangely prove a very strong price puzzle. So that basically. They uh, increase production, they increase the price level, and this basically means that we are confirming the view that they were not used in order to improve, the, in order to, um, uh, the, um, to achieve some certain macroeconomic uh, endogenous variable targets, but rather they, they, they were regarded and they were other ends. So um, on the other hand, we see that the shocks tend to have sh short and short-term strong effects, both on the um, short run and on the long run um, yield curve. So we're basically showing that they were used indeed for this purpose. And finally, we're going to assess the effect, the status of the international capital mobility and in particular i am referring to the show, the federal fund rate because in the gold standard the united states was basically the fulcrum of the world economy at least under the international monetary system as the dollar was a reference currency for all basically all, all the international monetary system and so um, we can see that shocks in the federal fund rate tend to have a very short run and limited effect on the exchange rate and the discount rate. So this basically means that the capital controls were indeed in place and they were indeed able to insulate the economy enough to allow for a certain spread between the domestic and the foreign interest rate. And finally, we um, arrive to the exchange rate, and we see that the exchange rate had virtually no effect on the trade balance. And this confirms the view that the exchange rate was not actually used, it was not devalued in order to adjust the trade balance, rather because it was um, rather the direct credit controls and the capital controls were used for it. So yes, there it is, and we are finished. So our results are broadly consistent with the Mondal Fleming framework with international capital controls and fixed exchange rates, and they confirm the evidence found by Monet. And we are able, by including much more variables, 
to gather then the may to generalize it to, to a general equilibrium setting. And there is now, there are many unanswered questions in our paper, first of all, for example, regarding fiscal policy, which has not been tackled because we need a mixed frequency because fiscal policy variables are quarterly while we use um, monthly variables. Then the econometric technique can be still refined. We can also analyze other countries, for example, the UK throughout the narrative approach. But this, this is our contribution to the literature. We have improved, we have refined uh, a certain way of analyzing the, the how macroeconomic and in particular monetary policy with various controls were implemented during the Bretton Woods era. And that's it. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you so much, Francesco. I think we finished right before eight. Um, does anyone have any questions? Any questions? You can also either speak or you can add it in the chat. I don't, there doesn't seem to be any. I think you gave a very thorough presentation, I, Francesco. Oh, wait, we question? got one. Perfect. Yeah. Go for it. Are you going to publish the research as you did last year in 2019? Um, we do actually have all the research is up on Rationale and the website link I will post soon on the Facebook group. Um, so it is published in a student-led journal. Whether or not Francesca wants to do anything more with it, I'm not too sure. But for now it is published, yes. Okay, thanks. I can also send the link to you privately. All right, if there are no further questions, well then I would like to thank everyone for coming. Apologies, of course, for having it run over, but I think we just had so many different groups and so many different eager speakers. And I think it was really exciting to see the work the students have done themselves. So I'm gonna hang back in case anyone has any further questions, but again, thank you so much for coming and feel free to log off. Have a lovely day guys, enjoy your evening or morning or afternoon or middle of the night, wherever you are.